Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to Finnegan's webcast, Navigating Your Life Sciences Opposition, Tips for Best Practice When You Are Opposing or Opposed. I'm Michelle Bosch, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome our presenters, Maeve O'Flynn and Victoria Randall. Maeve is a partner in Finnegan's London office. She is a European and UK patent attorney and has worked both in-house and in law firms. She has been filing and defending European oppositions for over 20 years. Maeve has a master's degree in chemistry from Oxford University and represents clients across a wide range of chemical technologies, including small molecule pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, and catalysis. Victoria is also in Finnegan's London office and has been practicing as a qualified European and UK patent attorney for over 10 years. Victoria specializes in the biotech sector and has been involved in numerous oppositions, including those relating to Nobel Prize winning technology, such as CRISPR and mRNA vaccines. Before I turn things over to our presenters, I invite everyone to participate by submitting questions today. This is intended to be an interactive webinar. Just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the webcast interface and type your question into the Q&A window, then click Submit. The questions will be answered today during the question and answer session, which will take place at the conclusion of the presentation. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the webcast help guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. And now I'll turn it over to our presenters to begin our presentation, navigating your life sciences opposition, tips for best practice when you are opposing or opposed. Welcome Maeve and Victoria, the floor is yours. Thanks Michelle, uh, welcome everyone. Um, as Michelle said, I'm Victoria. Um, we're going to actually kick off um, with some remote audience participation right out of the gate. Um, so we're going to begin with a poll. Um, the question's on the screen. What percentage of granted European patents are opposed? Um, and please use the poll function to, to cast your vote. And I can see whether you're voting or not, so please do go ahead and vote. <laughs> Great, I can see the votes coming in. So our audience says, most of you seem to think between six and 20% of patents are opposed. Not many of you think more than 20%. It's pretty even between six and 20 and two and five, and not many think less than 2%. Well, so the correct answer is between two and 5%. However, that's the average across all technology areas. The percentage in the life sciences arena is much higher. We don't have the exact stats on that, but I can give you a flavor of it by saying that of the 10 most opposed patents in 2022, nine were life sciences and pharma related. And the only outlier was a patent relating to a wind turbine. And so the take home message is that opposition is a key tool in the life sciences arena. And that for a proprietor, getting a granted patent may not be the end of the story. So that brings us to the agenda for what we're going to cover today in this webinar. Um, as Michelle said, please do use the Q&A button to pose your questions. So we'll begin with an overview of the EPO opposition procedure. So the what, the when, the who, and of course, the how much will it cost? So what is an EPO opposition? It's a centralized process to challenge a European patent. And I can hear many of you thinking, so why do we need this and the UPC? And we'll go into that in a bit more detail later. But the key differences are going to be timing, territorial and legal scope, and the C word, cost. So EPO opposition can be used to challenge a patent in all EPC contracting states, but it cannot be used to enforce a patent. When? The window for filing your opposition is relatively short. It must be filed within nine months of the mention of the grant of the patent. And who can file an opposition? Anyone can file an opposition, except you cannot oppose your own patent. 
You can also file an opposition anonymously, for example, by a straw man. The EPO actually even allows for opponents to buddy up and be co-opponents, paying a single opposition fee between them. And so to the cost. EPO opposition should be cheap and fast compared to national litigation proceedings and in all likelihood cheaper than the UPC, at the very least in view of the official fees. So what are the grounds for opposition? There are three key grounds of opposition, either that the subject matter is not patentable, basically it's not an invention, or it's not an acceptable invention. So inventions that are not acceptable are considered to be exceptions to patentability. An example of this in the life sciences field would be a process that modifies a germline genetic identity of humans. And anyone following the CRISPR related cases may have some experience of the difficulties on navigating this exception. Then there are the obvious grounds of lack of novelty and inventive step or insufficient disclosure. The final one on the list on the slide is an example of one key way in which EPA decisions may end up differing for, from other courts and jurisdictions. And this is the added matter provision. And the EPA has a very strict and often slightly bamboozling approach to added matter, but it essentially asks whether the invention can be directly and unambiguously derived from the application as originally filed. There are patent challenge contenders that cannot be raised during EPA opposition, and these include clarity, unity, and entitlement. So how do you file an opposition? You need to provide a notice of opposition, which sets out the key details of the patent, the proprietor, and the entity opposing. You must indicate the extent of the opposition, whether you're opposing the whole patent or just specific claims. This is then supported by the grounds or your arguments and the evidence, which is documents and data, etc. And of course, it will cost you a fee of 880 euros. The slide provides an overview of the timeline for an opposition, and this is in first instance proceedings. And the key timings to note are you must file the opposition within nine months from the mention of the grant. The summons to oral proceedings will be issued at least six months before the date set for the oral proceedings. And the deadline for filing written, written submissions will be two months before the date set for the oral proceedings, the Rule 116 deadline. So as I said, this is uh, representing first instance proceedings and, and the timeline that you'll see there. Um, the decision of the opposition division can be appealed and the timing for an appeal is a little bit harder to predict. Thanks, Victoria. So I'll, I'll jump in now. Um, Victoria's just provided us with um, an infographic on the timeline of an opposition. And here we actually have some EPO statistics on how long it actually takes. Um, many of you may have heard that the EPO, the European Patent Office, are very slow. And that's something that they've been trying to address. And with opposition, they have been addressing it pretty successfully um, over the last 10 years. So you can see back in 2016, the, the mean and the median time for an opposition. So this is from filing the opposition, so from the end of the nine month period to when you get that first instance decision from the opposition division, that was a about between sort of 25 to 30 months, the, the average. But you can also see from the blue line that 5% of oppositions actually took about 65 months. So there was a small proportion, small but significant proportion of oppositions that were really slow. And I think you can see from this graph that the the EPO have really managed to reduce that. So they've got that P95 line down so that there are very few oppositions taking such a long time now. So now um, the average, so the mean or the medium is about 18 or 19 months. So again, that's from filing the opposition to getting your first instance decision. So you can safely say to your, to your clients or to your employer that an opposition is going to take about 18 or 19 months, but even, even still, we have 5% of oppositions that are taking more than 30 months, but, but that's much lower than it used to be. 
Um, you can see that the trend was downwards here until 2020. Um, and then the pandemic intervened and uh, the EPO initially struggled um, with that, mainly because um, almost all opposition proceedings conclude with an oral hearing. And, to, and pre-COVID, most of the oral hearings, almost all the uh, oral hearings were in person. And it took a while to start switching to video conference proceedings. To start off with, the um, proprietor and the opponents could actually say, no, we don't want to have uh, a video conference proceeding. So at the start of the pandemic, everything was just being postponed. But eventually, um, many of the proceedings were moved to video conference such that video conference is now pretty much the default and you only get in-person proceedings if there are, there are unusual circumstances that warrant it. So, um, but you can see that things are getting back on track after COVID, after a slight increase, the lines seem to be tending downwards again. So opposition is a relatively, relatively, <laughs> it's, it's it's quicker than it used to be. It's still not that quick, but it's it's quicker than it used to be. And I believe the EPO are still seeking to reduce this yet further. So I've spoken about oral proceedings and I've said that um, most oppositions conclude with an oral proceedings. It's the party's right to be heard in an oral proceedings. And almost inevitably, at least one of the parties will request oral proceedings. So this is where um, a decision is made. It's actually made on the day at the end of the oral proceedings. So you will come away from the oral proceedings knowing that the opposition division have decided to revoke the patent or maintain the pa patent or maintain it in amended form. So traditionally these were in person, either in Munich or in The Hague, but now more commonly um, they are video conference oral proceedings. So who appears at these oral proceedings? We have the opposition division. So those are the members of the European Patent Office who are taking the decision. There's always at least three members of the opposition division. You have a chair and two technically qualified examiners. And so those three uh, people will decide. Um, sometimes you get an additional member of the, op of the opposition division. You will get a legally qualified examiner and that's when there are tricky legal questions that will be need to ask that have, that have been raised during the opposition. But that's relatively unusual. Usually the opposition division has three members. Uh, the patentee, the proprietor, gets to attend the oral proceedings. The opponents get to, ten, to attend the oral proceedings. So that might be one opponent. It could be 10 opponents for some of these CRISPR cases that Victoria was talking about. So the patentee will be there, the opponents will be there. Um, members of the public are allowed to attend if they like. That, that works with video conference proceedings. It also works, um, you can turn up at The Hague or in Munich if you want to. Um, and sometimes as well there are interpreters because the oral proceedings can be in English, French or German, depending on the language of the patent. Um, and if it's in an EPO language, English, French or German, that you don't speak or you can't understand, you have the right to request simultaneous um, translation. And it's, it's amazing how good they are, to be honest. They are very, very good. And if um, you are in proceedings where the language isn't a language that you speak, um, you can still take a full role um, in the proceedings because uh, you have the interpreters on hand and, and they're really amazing. So what are the outcomes of an opposition? I think I said this before, there are, there are essentially three outcomes. The opposition can be rejected, which means the patent is maintained as it was granted. Um, the patent can be maintained in amended form, and we'll talk a bit more about this later on. The, the um, proprietor gets the opportunity to submit um, a series of amended claims, or the patent can be revoked in full, so there just simply is no patent anymore. Um, as I said, the outcome is announced at the end of the oral proceedings, but you actually get the written decision sometime after that, sometimes three or four weeks, but it, it can be a bit 
longer, depending on quite how much they have to say. And here are some EPO stats on what happens. And I think that the sort of the headline message from this is that oppositions are really effective. Not many patents come out of an opposition completely unscathed. So you can see the red sections of these bars here. That represents where an opposition was just rejected. So that's the patent is maintained as granted. And that's actually a relatively low percentage, pretty much around a third or less than a third. Um, in a third of cases, most years, uh, a third of patents are revoked so that there is no patent anymore. And then you get this middle ground where um, the patent is maintained in amended form. And sometimes that's a victory for the patentee because they make a few minor trivial amendments and their patent is maintained. They essentially retain the same scope. But then sometimes that's a real victory for the opponents because the claims are really narrowed such that the proprietor ends up with much narrower protection than they originally had. And maybe then the opponents can actually do the things they wanted to do. They're no longer prevented from, you know, launching the products they want or carrying out the processes they want to carry out by that patent. So, so that middle grey bar, um, th that that's sometimes a win for the patentee, sometimes a win um, for the um, opponents. So those are the typical outcomes. This is after first instance. So this is the decision of the opposition division. And as Victoria mentioned earlier, you can appeal the decision of the opposition division. So who can appeal? And that's any party who is adversely affected by the decision. So if the patent is revoked, the patent proprietor can appeal. If the opposition is rejected, so the patent is maintained, then um, the opponents can appeal. If you're in the middle and the patent is maintained in amended form, then everybody can appeal. So you, you often get both parties appealing in those circumstances. And then the other parties get to be parties to the appeal proceedings as of right, if that makes sense. So, so they are not an appellant, but they will be part of the proceedings. They'll be able to make submissions and submit arguments. You have two months of the written decision to file your notice of appeal. You have to pay the appeal fee, which is almost 3,000 euros. Um, but then you have an additional two months, so four months from the decision to submit your grounds. But those grounds really do need to be pretty complete. You, you must submit your complete case essentially by that four month deadline. And I was quite interested to find out, to read the statistic that about 40% of opposition decisions are appealed. Um, I think in the life sciences, it's higher than that. Certainly in my experience, I expect life sciences case, uh, opposition decisions, decisions are pretty much always appealed. Um, so I, I, to me, that seems quite low, um, but that's clearly all oppositions. And I, I think it probably is slightly higher in the life sciences field. Some more stats. We've got lots of stats today. Um, what happens in appeal? And interestingly, most decisions of the opposition division are maintained. So in about two thirds of cases, that's the red bar, the first instance decision is upheld. So either the patent is maintained because that's what the opposition division said, or it's revoked because that's what the opposition division said. So in most cases, um, the first instance decision is upheld. But there are a, about a third of cases where um, the first instance decision is amended or the first instance decision is revoked. So appeal is is worthwhile. You know, it, it's not that it never works. It, it does. It does often result in um, a different outcome. So we now have another poll to keep you all awake. So um, I've talked quite a lot about outcomes, but I'm, we're interested in your thoughts on which party bears the cost of EP opposition proceedings. So we've given you three options here. I think you probably can't see this slide yet, but the question, the poll question is, which party 
bears the cost of European opposition proceedings? Is it A, the losing party who bears the costs? Is it B, each side? Or is it C, each side, but the opposition division may order apportionment in exceptional circumstances? So I can see that we've got lots of answers coming in. I'm interested to see what people think, because this is probably different from um, national proceedings that, that maybe some of you are used to. I'll just wait a little bit longer, see if we get a few more, a few more responses. So yeah, which party bears the costs of EP opposition proceedings? Okay, it seems that everybody knows, or most people know, it's yes, it's as almost 80% of you said, it's each side, but the opposition division may order apportionment in exceptional circumstances. Um, and, and they really are quite exceptional. Um, maybe, well, maybe that's slightly overstating it, but, but it's something to bear in mind if you are involved in opposition uh, proceedings. Are you in a circumstance that that would fall into this exceptional bucket? Um, it, it's typically things where one of the parties has done something irregular. Um, they've submitted something late, and they could they really could have submitted it earlier. They've done something where they've hidden something. It's it's those sort of behaviours that fall into into the exceptional circumstances bracket. So, you know, you're you're allowed to argue your case, you're allowed to present whatever arguments you want to, you're allowed to use the different EPO procedures, like making a request for oral proceedings. But if you're doing things in a kind of underhand way, a malicious way, I think is the phrase used in the guidelines, then you may fall into this exceptional circumstances bracket. So yeah, something to bear in mind. And with that, I think I'm passing back to Victoria. Yeah, thanks, Maeve. Um, so next, we'll move on to what you should think about when preparing your opposition and your defence. So this is thinking about the written procedure that, that comes before the oral hearing. Um, so <laughs> when preparing your opposition statement, the, the key message is to be as thorough as you can, as early as you can. Try to find arguments under all possible grounds because you'll not be able to add, raise new grounds at a later stage. Um, make sure that you have considered the dependent claims when setting out the grounds, because it's likely that these will form the basis for the proprietor's later claim amendments um, and auxiliary claim requests. It's a good idea to check the prosecution history and look what happened there, but also look to see if any third party observations were filed. Um, you know, there might be some documents on file that were already going to assist you in, in generating your um, arguments for opposition. And it's also a good idea to look at related cases. So if there are parent cases or divisional cases or just related families, see if third party observations were filed there or any oppositions were filed there. Make sure you have all arguments and documents and evidence on file as early as possible. It might be tempting to plan to spring a surprise later in proceedings, but there's only a chance that that will work if you can explain how your line of reasoning has been consistent and supported from the very beginning. Um, and although you may want to be very thorough, also be focused um, in how you present your arguments. Vague arguments starting from weak positions or multiple different documents may actually only dilute the impact of your opposition. We often get asked if uh, we need any data, and we consider this again in a little bit more detail and where that can be a good thing and a bad thing. Um, but wet data can be instrumental in demonstrating that the pattern lacks sufficient disclosure or that the claims lack inventor step because they're not supported across the scope. Um, but you need to start thinking about what data you might need as soon as you consider that an opposition might be necessary. It's never too late. It takes a long time to generate wet data. It takes a long time to find someone to do it. Um, and, you know, you can find that you are almost too late into proceedings before you've even got that data. So if you think you might need it, really start with that early. 
And so then if you're defending, the key message is the same. Be as thorough as you can, as early as you can. Present a complete rebuttal to all of the grounds that have been raised by the opponents. Try to have a claim request that it doesn't have to be your main claim request, but try to have a claim request that is as close to what is exemplified and supported, but that still covers your commercial interests. Um, there is no limit to how many auxiliary requests that you file, but filing enough to single battleship will not win you over with the opposition division or the appeal board. Um, too many auxiliary requests and they will become frustrated. Um, Rule 80 stipulates that amendments must be occasioned by a ground of opposition. And essentially, this means you can't use your opposition proceedings to clean up your claims. Um, so, for example, to rectify clarity issues, um, there must have been a ground of opposition lead to that amendment. It doesn't actually have to have been invoked by the opponent, but there needs to be a, a, it needs to be responsive to a ground. If you think you will need expert evidence, again, start talking to candidates early. Um, you'll want to find someone who aligns with your position um, and, and is able to articulate clearly um, and concisely. Um, and you might find that you actually have to speak to quite a number of people before you really find the right person. So it's good to start with that process early. And again, do you need data? Um, the thinking is the same as for when you are opposing. The earlier it is considered and the experiments are actioned, the better. Ah, oh, yes, and case law. That may be cited by you or against you, um, but try to have those key supporting cases referred to early in the proceedings with reasons of why they're relevant. Don't leave the case law search at the last minute. Um, many opposition divisions don't actually like surprise case law citations. Um, despite the fact we're all supposed to know all the case law, but you know, don't, don't spring a T number on your opposition division. Oh, back a slide. So yeah, we'll move on to um, consider how the opposition procedure might play out um, and how you can navigate that and the tactics that are available and any practical considerations that we can offer here in the webinar. So as Maeve's already mentioned, opposition oral proceedings via video conference are now commonplace. Um, and that's even the case um, when there's more than two parties. Um, it is possible to request a change of format. So if you've been allocated an in-person hearing, but you'd rather have a video conference hearing, or you've been allocated a video conference hearing, but you'd rather have a um, an in-person hearing, you can request that. Um, you will need to provide evidence for what, why that request is, um, and therefore, obviously, why the format is particularly important to those considerations. Um, and ultimately, the decision will come down to the opposition division or the appeal board. And um, some things that we've seen seen as being or a uh, touted as being successful when you want an in-person hearing is that you know you want to show and tell something um so you know you want the od or the appeal board to be able to see a particular product um that can be a reason for an in-person hearing um other reasons might be if you have someone who's actually hard of hearing it can be quite difficult um to conduct video conference proceedings um in those scenarios so that can also be a reason but ultimately it will be up to the opposition division or the appeal board essentially to decide whether you get change of format. We're finding that first instance proceedings are, are more often than not video conference now, um, but appeal proceedings are a bit more likely to be in person, especially if you've got a, a multi-parties situation. Um, and in appeal, you're actually more likely to get a request for a change of format accepted um, just because of the gravitas of the proceedings. Uh, mixed mode is possible, um, but that's not a request of the members of the public. And we'll come back to attendance of members of the public in a minute. Um, in our experience and talking to my colleagues within Finnegan and elsewhere, um, we see that video conference proceedings seem to take longer than in-person proceedings, um, especially when there are multiple parties. And so we've also observed that the video conference proceedings run to the end of the allocated time without a conclusion. Um, whereas this appears to happen 
less often with in-person hearings. Um, one factor might be that they seem more willing to impose a curfew when it's a video conference proceeding, whereas in person, they seem to kind of run quite late and not impose a curfew. And so that we've actually found that there's a greater chance of video conference just falling to another day um, and depending of the, depending on the scheduling, this could be the next day. It could be in the same week. They result in the reissuance, reissuance of the Rule 1 and 6 and the summons, which actually then opens the door for filing further submissions. And again, we've seen a variety of approaches from the opposition division about that and whether they are going to allow further submissions. Specific question for Annalise from um, De Clark and Partners. And she did ask, are we seeing a difference in life sciences um, out, in, in outcome when there's a video conference compared to an in-person conference? We don't have any stats on that yet. Um, I think people have tried to scrape the data, but I don't think there's anything particularly conclusive. All I can say is that, as just mentioned, call it Ali, where you've got complex subject matter and a lot of parties. Um, and a lot of we are seeing the video conference proceedings um, in, in months' time. So sciences um, are having only really operated in the life sciences arena. Um, those things are probably correlating. Um, Maeve talked to us quite a lot already about the interpreters, um, but just to, to go back and bring out a few other points. Um, so as you said, if you want to speak in an official language other than the proceedings, you do need to request that at least a month in advance, or you can make your own arrangements. Um, you're not actually allowed to speak in one language and hear in another. Um, and that the interpreters will be present and they'll provide that simultaneous translation for you. Um, and this is the same for video conference. Um, they'll be included um, in the Zoom call. And it's, it's really nifty to watch that happen, actually. Um, and so where there are actually lots of rules at the end surrounding which languages can be used, actually, <laughs> almost anything goes as long as everyone is willing to agree and arrangements for the relevant translations can be made. So when you attend oral proceedings, either in person or by video conference, you'll probably get ID'd. Um, <laughs> and, and for European patent attorneys, um, you can just present your EPO card um, or your passport. Um, if you are attending in a group of people, it might just be necessary that one person presents ID and then they can vouch for everybody else. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind if you are intending on joining at oral proceedings and you're not a European patent attorney and you don't have your EPO card, make sure you've got some sort of ID or have arranged with someone who can vouch for you. So the summons to oral proceedings sets the date of the hearing and that date, the date for that hearing, the, the time between the summons and the hearing will be at least six months at least. Um, and that summons also sets the Rule 116 EPC deadline, and that's for it sets the deadline for the final submissions, and those will be two months ahead of the hearing. And that communication is, is often, but not always, um, accompanied by the preliminary opinion of the opposition division. You may see that your hearings are scheduled back to back if they concern related patents, for example, divisionals. So if you've got a series of cases that are going into opposition and or appeal um, and they're all kind of linked together and concerning similar subject matter, you may find that you are in the EPA for, for two weeks dealing with all of those in one go. Um, one of the things we have seen is that uh, if one of the parties to the proceedings files very late submissions, um, you know, you know, a month, maybe a couple of weeks before the hearing, but there's actually no way around the fact that they're incredibly relevant. You may actually see that the oral proceedings are 
delayed, rescheduled. Um, if you're on the receiving, receiving end of those late filings, either as proprietor or opponent, you'll need to request that delay um, and set out um, exactly your reasons why you think there should be a delay, um, explaining why the late submissions require further consideration and why you need more time. It's actually quite unusual for that to be granted, um, but it is more likely to, to be approved if you can get all your parties to agree to the rescheduling. Again, challenging, but it does happen. So it's usual for the opposition division to begin with adding matter, and then that's likely to be followed by priority, then novelty, then inventor step, then sufficiency, then excluded subject matter. However, sometimes the opposition division start with what they see as the crux of the case. And um, so, for example, inventive step. Um, so you might have an expectation of the order of the hearing, um, but then you go into the hearing and the opposition division wants to start from a completely different place. Um, and you yourself can actually make requests to the opposition division about the order in which the grounds are considered. Um, and even the order in which the auxiliary requests are considered. So if you want to diverge from the existing numbering, um, but don't want to withdraw any requests, you can ask for certain auxiliary requests to be considered ahead of others. Um, but it's entirely up to the opposition division or the appeal board as to the order in which matters are heard and auxiliary requests are considered. So you, you can ask, but it will be up to them as to how they decide to run the hearing. Um, it's also quite possible that the opposition division will have diverged from their preliminary opinion. Um, so, as I said, you might get that preliminary opinion with the summons and it will set out how the opposition division views the case and, and, and their opinion of the matters that are in issue. Um, and then when you arrive at the hearing, you may find that they've actually changed their minds and that might not even be due to additional summons in the interim. You may even find that on the day they're persuaded to change their preliminary opinion. Um, and, you know, they will say this is a divergence from our preliminary opinion. Um, and that can be good or bad for a patentee, um, but it increases the chance that they'll be able to submit responsive claim requests on the day. There's not much that you can do about that as an opponent, except for ask for more time or a delay if you think that can be justified. Um, in, in our experience, again, auxiliary claim requests are often filed and admitted on the day during the first instance hearing. And as I said, the, the success of that will depend on the divergence from the opposition division's preliminary opinion, um, the opposition division's discretion, and possibly how behind schedule the proceedings are already running. It's highly unlikely that any further documentary evidence will be accepted on the day, and for both claim requests and new documents, this is much less likely in appeal proceedings. So who can attend and who can speak at oral proceedings? Um, so it's possible to attend oral proceedings as a member of the public, um, either in person or via video conference. To attend by video conference, you must submit an email request to the EPO at least three days before the hearing, and the hearing day doesn't count. Um, and so who can speak? Well, pretty much anyone within reason can speak at oral proceedings, but you should inform the EPO in advance, ideally when responding to the summons or as soon as possible thereafter. It's possible to request additional speakers on the day, such as an inventor, um, but these on the day requests can be refused by the opposition division or the appeal board. Um, yes, attorneys can speak and present evidence, but they're not allowed to argue the case. Trainee patent, trainee patent attorneys can speak at proceedings under the supervision of a qualified European patent attorney. And so you may want to bring an expert into your oral proceedings, um, but expert evidence at the EPO is more often presented as a written statement um, or a declaration, declaration. It's very rare for experts to speak in person at uh, EPO oral proceedings. It's kind of accepted at the EPO that the side presenting an expert is likely to have tailored what will be said, but the expert makes a declaration that the contents are true, so you can't fabricate. 
And it is always worth remembering that it is possible that an EPO expert will be called on for US, dep US deposition and or be cross-examined in corresponding US cases. Um, and in contrast, there's not the forum for that at the EPO, no cross-examination. Um, so just remember when presenting experts before the EPO, there is a chance they could be called on in the US. So in life sciences proceedings, additional experiment experimental data is often generated and presented. Um, so the opponent might present data perhaps to show that the pattern examples do not work as disclosed or that the results are more varied than reported in the pattern or even in the prior art. And this is more common in opposition. Data that is not generated until the appeal stage is less likely to be accepted into the proceedings. You know, you're expected to have got any experiment, experimental data um, that you might require to support your case in into the first instance proceedings, and it will be a challenge to get it incorporated into appeal proceedings. Um, just because one person files data doesn't mean you can't file counter data. Um, so the patentee is able to submit data, and that might be in response to the opponent's data. Um, so don't assume that the opponent's data is watertight. It may also be flawed and vulnerable to challenge and vice versa. However, it's worth remembering that the opposition division and the appeal board are technically qualified, but they are unlikely to be willing to dig into rafts of extra data. Um, so it's important to use the extra data to draw out the main message. Um, you know, don't don't submit rafts and rafts of data and expect them to willingly grapple with that. You know, you need to deliver that to them in a format which they can understand. And again, remember that any data that is generated, any data, <laughs> whether you got a good result for your case or a bad result, um, may be open to discovery in corresponding US proceedings. So what do you do if you're the patentee in multi-parties proceedings? Um, I think we would all agree that defense is trickier than attack in this scenario. Um, and with increasing frequency, we're seeing 10 or more opponents for patents covering commercially successful inventions. Um, to defend a patent against multiple opponents, it's likely that you will need a large team and a big budget. It will be necessary to defend against multiple different lines of attack from various opponents. Um, and it may be a similar attack, attack presented in kind of a different way. And you need to think about whether you need to address those attacks separately um, or whether they can be sort of grouped into one. Um, and sometimes the easiest way is just to deal with them individually. Sometimes it's better to group them. That will be a you know case by case matter. Uh, you need to think about all facets of the case as early as you can. So you'll need to do a, a good deal of preemptive thinking. If we go this way, what way will they go? What can we expect to see from the opponents? Have we seen everything that we expect to see? what will be their likely next step. Um, you need to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of your case and prepare accordingly. Think about your auxiliary claim requests in detail. Try to have something to fall back on that will survive all possible attacks, is exemplified in the pattern and covers your commercial interests. And as we keep saying, you'll need to have all possible positions and arguments on file as soon as possible, ideally with your response to the notice of opposition. The further proceedings you further into proceedings you are, the harder it is to present new evidence and claim requests. And we're over to Maeve now. Thanks. Thanks, Victoria. So we're going to slightly change perspective now, and we're going to talk about global litigation strategy. So as a European attorney, um, when you're involved in an opposition, you essentially want to get a win for your client. If your client is an opponent, you want that patent revoked. If your client is the proprietor, you want the patent maintained either as granted or in a very similar form, as close to that granted form as you can get. So, so essentially, that is your concern. But that is not always your client's concern. So you arguably need to think more broadly, you need to consider the broader commercial context. You don't want to be in a situation where your win in Europe 
causes problems in other jurisdictions. So this is what we're going to talk about now. And I'm going to talk through two different scenarios where um, everything else that's happening may affect how or what you do in your European opposition. So the first scenario here is one that we have seen with life sciences clients, and I'll, I'll talk through it in, in, in some detail. So this is a scenario where you have both a European opposition and appeal, but you also have US proceedings. So here in this particular scenario, we've got both US and a litigation and US IPR proceedings. And for those who aren't familiar with those acronyms, um, ANDA litigation is, um, ANDA stands for abbreviated new drug application. So that is something that a generics company uh, will file. And then the patent proprietor gets the opportunity to um, file a suit to stay the regula regulatory approval that that generics company is seeking. So this is um, litigation that occurs commonly in the US in relation to uh, pharmaceutical patents. IPR proceedings are proceedings before the PTAB. So the PTAB is the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And that, so those are proceedings um, essentially before the, the US Patent Office, but it, it's, it's the branch of the US Patent Office that deals with these post-grant challenges. So IPR is inter-parties review. Um, this slide could also say PGR proceedings. PGR are post-grant reviews. And IPR and PGR proceedings are, are pretty similar, but the timing is slightly different. So the PGRs are filed um, in the nine-month period post-grant, whereas IPRs are filed um, at any point after that. And most, the majority of PTAB proceedings are these IPR proceedings. So you might get a scenario where um, your client has a patent. It's often um, a, a kind of a, a secondary um, a secondary patent insofar as it relates to maybe not your compound of interest, but it relates to a formulation, it relates to a dose, dosage regime, or it relates to some sort of combination of, of your compound plus other um, active ingredients. And when we're talking about those secondary patents, the timing that I've tried to show here with this graphic um, might come into play. So you've got your European opposition that's occurring. So that is where third parties are challenging your European patent. But the equivalent patent might be litigated in and a litigation in the US. And there might also be a challenge to the validity of that patent before the PTAB in US IPR proceedings. So all these things are going on at once. What quite often happens is that the European opposition time-wise is a bit earlier, and that's what I've tried to show here. So your European opposition is taking place before the US proceedings. And I'm going to talk um, through some of the considerations that you need to have in mind during your European opposition, because what you do in that opposition might have consequences for those US proceedings. Um, you need to talk to your client, obviously, about what the commercial priorities are. It may be that the European patent is really important, or it may be that the European patent is simply nice to have. And actually, what's commercially most significant are the US proceedings. So you need to have a clear idea in mind where the commercial priorities lie. And it might be that the priorities lie in the US because in Europe, you may not need to rely on your secondary patents. You may have data exclusivity that extends um, for much longer. So the patent is nice to have, but not critical. Whereas in the US, the regulatory exclusivity might be a shorter period. It, it's and, and therefore, those secondary patents become really, really commercially critical. So this is a scenario that you might you might come across. And I'm just going to talk through um, how you should approach the European opposition if you expect you might 
be in this scenario. So the next few slides, I'm going to cover some actions that you might want to take in your European opposition and the potential risks associated with those actions um, for possible subsequent US proceedings. So as part of your European opposition, you're going to want to, you're going to have to address novelty and inventive step. Those grounds are pretty much always raised. Most European oppositions come down to inventive step. Typically, um, that, that's the critical, the critical ground. So as part of your European opposition, you're going to want to discuss the prior art documents. You're going to want to discuss the granted pattern. You're probably going to need to provide some sort of technical interpretation of those documents and of the granted pattern. You're going to explain the differences between the prior art and your claimed invention. You might want to explain what's implicitly disclosed in a prior art document. You might want to describe the technical effect for a claim invention. These are all routine things that you want to do in Europe. Does this pose a risk for your US litigation or your US proceedings, your US PTAB proceedings? You could argue, well, no, because the, the legal standards are different. The laws on novelty are non-obvious and not the same. So why should statements that you're making in Europe be held against you in the US? But I think it's not so much the legal arguments you make in Europe, but technical statements that you make that could come back to haunt you. And we've seen this in um, petitions for, for IPR proceedings. The US attorneys who are working on those petitions, they will analyze what you have said in Europe and they will point out inconsistencies. So if you've taken a position in Europe and said, well, clearly, what is meant by this section of prior art document D1 is this. And then you're trying to argue something contrary, something inconsistent in your US proceedings. Or, for example, you may have argued something inconsistent when getting your US patent granted. That is something that will be highlighted by people challenge or by, by challengers of your patent. So you need to think about this and just be mindful. You need to consider those statements you're making in Europe and do, do will those pose any risk for, for your US? Are, are you, is there a risk that you're going to be taking contrary positions? And you've also got to kind of be mindful of the arguments you're going to need to make to show infringement, because it's possible that there will be an inconsistency between your technical statements in Europe and trying to argue that a particular um, competitor uh, product falls within the scope of a claim. So that's something as well to bear in mind. So in Europe, you're going to have to address other grounds, not just novelty and inventor step. Um, we've discussed that added subject matter is, is often raised in European oppositions. It can be incredibly effective. And you might think, well, this is kind of an EPO specific thing. It doesn't really matter what I say in relation to this. But again, you may find that in Europe, you need to make technical statements in, a, in order to support your added subject matter um, defense or, or attack. Um, so again, you just need to be mindful about saying what might be implicit in your pattern or what the skilled person might understand. Um, the same with sufficiency. You may need to um, make arguments um, relating to establishing sufficiency across the scope of a claim. You may need to argue that the skilled person could work the invention across the scope of the claim without undue burden. But just keep in mind, is it possible that a US attorney is going to be able to repurpose that argument to allege something else in the US? They may say that you said, um, you know, you, it was quite straightforward to carry out the invention across this broad scope. You've only got two examples, but yet the skilled person really could carry out the invention across the scope. Is there something in that that, that could support um, kind of a, a counter argument in US proceedings? So you just need to be mindful of, of making broad sweeping statements in your European opposition and just think about how these might be um, repurposed. Um, we've spoken quite a bit about data and 
the opposition divisions are keen to see data. Whenever I'm involved in an opposition, I'm typically asking um, my client, can you generate some data? This is really common for European representatives. We, we're really keen to see additional data because it can be really helpful, um, particularly if your patent is granted, it it's, hasn't got much data. So data can help you establish inventive step across the scope of a claim. You may want to demonstrate some sort of synergy um, to help you with your problem solution analysis for inventive step. Um, you may want to establish that some teaching in the prior art either does or does not inevitably lead to a particular result. So it's really useful in Europe often to, to obtain data. But, and I've, I've heard this from my US colleagues often, you really need to think about, do you need that data? And exactly what data do you need? Because as Victoria said earlier, if you then enter US proceedings and there's discovery, um, all of that data will be uncovered. And that's everything. That's the experiments that didn't work, the experiments that didn't show that you wanted them to show. In, in Europe, it's, it's permissible to, to not submit all your data or to decide, actually, it didn't really show what we wanted it to show. We're just not going to submit it. But that will come out in US discovery. And you just need to think before you even do the experiments, um, is there a risk here that this data might not show what we're hoping it will show? And the data might support non-obviousness positions in the US or it might... Um, it might help somebody trying to attack the um, enablement or written description requirements. So it's just good to check in with your US colleagues if you're seeking to obtain additional data and just get their take on, are there any risks here? Is this a sensible thing to be doing? And are there things we can do to mitigate some of the risk? Can we actually get a third party to carry out some of these experiments? Will that help here? That, those are the kind of questions that it's, it's worth asking. And Victoria also spoke about experts, expert reports. Um, experts appearing at oral proceedings can be very helpful. Um, you can use them to help establish what the common general knowledge is, which can help your inventive step analysis. They can interpret terms, they can explain uh, technical significance of something. But as Victoria said earlier, beware that these experts, if, if you rely on them in European proceedings, they might be deposed in subsequent US proceedings. So that may affect who you want to choose as your expert. How would that particular expert respond in, in a deposition? So just something to bear in mind. Um, Sometimes experts just like going to the oral proceedings and maybe they're not that useful. Um, but um, yeah, just, just be mindful of, of the potential consequences of that. Um, and I, there are some related scenarios. Um, I was talking here about a scenario where you have and a litigation, um, which is kind of a type of patent infringement proceedings, but this this thinking can apply to other scenarios where you have traditional infringement proceedings. Somebody's launched a product, you're seeking to prevent them from selling that product. And again, you it will be difficult in those US patent infringement proceedings to make statements that are completely inconsistent what, with what you said in European opposition proceedings. Um, we also saw a recent US case where somebody was trying to assert a US patent um, where they previously opposed um, the European equivalent, the, the ownership had changed. And that can be problematic because then it's very easy for, for the other side to say, well, you oppose this patent. You think this patent is, is defective. Why are you now trying to assert it? So just beware of situations like that. Don't think that what has happened in Europe doesn't necessarily have consequences elsewhere. I, I don't want to overstate this because... A lot of your statements in Europe, the law is different, the facts may be different, the claims may be different in the US. Often there won't be an issue, but sometimes there will be. So just be aware of that. So we've got another poll. I'm going to move on to my second scenario now, which relates to the UPC, the Unified Patent Court. So we've got another poll question for you here. Hopefully you'll be able to see it in a minute. 
So the question for this poll, which of these countries are members of the EPC, the European Patent Convention, but not signatories of the UPC? So that's the Unified Patent Court. So the potential answers are A, the UK, B, Switzerland, C, Norway, D, Spain, or E, all of the above. So who is in the, the EPC, but not the UPC? Okay, I can see answers coming in. Okay, I'll just wait a little bit longer. We've got about 50%. And the UPC is very new. We've only had it for six months. So um, I wouldn't expect everybody to know this. Okay. We've got quite a lot of answers now. Let's see what everybody thinks. Yeah, so the answer is all of the above. So those countries are in the EPC, the European Patent Convention, but for different reasons they're not part of the UPC. Um, for, the, for Switzerland and Norway, they are not members of the European Union and have never been members of the European Union, so um, aren't able to be part of the UPC. For the UK, post-Brexit, um, the UK is no longer part of the European Union, so withdrew from the, the Unified Patent Court and, and the Unitary Patent System. Spain um, could be a member um, because they are in the European Union, but for um, reasons primarily to do with languages, they decided that they um, would not join up, so translation uh, reasons. So they are not a signatory of the UPC. So those are significant states that are in the EPC but aren't in the UPC. So all of the above was correct. So... I'm going to talk about a scenario where you've got co-pending uh, European opposition appeal proceedings and also UPC proceedings. And this is brand new. We haven't had this until this year because the Unified Patent Court only started on the 1st of June. So, so to a certain extent, what I say now is going to be wholly speculative because this is, this is, this is brand new. But it, it's a really interesting um, scenario that, that we just haven't seen before. And it will be really interesting to see what happens in these cases where we've got um, we've got co-pending EPO and UPC proceedings. Um, the scenario I've shown here, you can see that time-wise, I've got the European Opposition and Appeal starting at the same time as the UPC infringement and revocation actions. But the hope is that the UPC is going to be really speedy and we know that opposition and appeal together can take quite a long time. So it's my expectation that in some cases we'll see a conclusion of the UPC proceedings before we see a conclusion of the EPO opposition and appeal proceedings. So that will be procedurally interesting. So there are two real examples where this is happening now and, and we, can, we can follow these cases and see what happens. So this first uh, patent, this first European patent here, um, you may have seen um, it's this, this is owned by Harvard College, but the, um, the relevant UPC case, uh, the, the party is 10 times genomics and the other party is nanostring. So that this patent was granted on the 7th of June um, and they proceeded with the unitary patent. So for those that don't know, a unitary patent is a single patent right that covers the whole territory of the UPC, of all those countries that have signed up to it. And they used that unitary patent to launch an infringement action at the UPC, at the Unified Patent Court. And there has been a counterclaim for revocation. So they launched an infringement action against Nanostring. Now, Nanostring has filed an opposition at the EPO. So we have both the UPC counterclaim and the opposition at the EPO. Um, and I think here, the um, counterclaim for revocation, that's almost certainly going to conclude before the opposition and appeal. Um, the patent was granted on the 7th of June and the opposition was filed really not that long after. Um, we're used to oppositions being filed just before the end of that nine-month period. But here it was filed... Um, 
just over a month after, which is which is really interesting. Um, so, I, and I haven't looked at the, this opposition statement, but I imagine they've used pretty much a lot of the information that they've also used in their counterclaim for revocation. So it will be really interesting to follow those two, um, the, the UPC action and the EPO opposition, and to see what extent they are similar or whether things play out differently. We also have this Amgen case. Um, this is part of the, um, there's a huge global litigation between Amgen and Sanofi. Um, and this particular European patent was granted in May. It's not a unitary patent, but they validated nationally and they didn't opt it out of the, of the UPC. So they are able to enforce those that, that European bundle patent at the UPC. So there were both infringement proceedings and a revocation action. And then there is also um, a European opposition as well. So um, the UPC uh, action was was uh, filed, I think, on the 1st of June, the first possible day. And the opposition was filed on the 10th of November 2023. So uh, very recently. So it will be interesting to see what happens in, in these cases and others like it. Um, there are some differences between UPC revocation actions and EPO oppositions. The timing is different because UPC revocation is available during the life of the patent, whereas opposition must be filed in that nine month window. Um, I, in my head, the UPC revocation actions were all gonna take place later, but actually these two cases I've just shown you, the UPC revocation action is, is going to take place earlier because the nine month window hasn't even, you know, closed yet. So it will be, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that the, how the timing will play out in those scenarios. Um, as we found out with our poll question, um, not all EPC states are UPC states. So if you have a successful UPC revocation action and your EPO opposition is ongoing, that will probably still continue because the UPC revocation action, that's not going to apply to Switzerland, it's not going to apply to Spain, it's not going to apply to the UK. So these are big markets and I would expect that um, the opposition will continue to find out what's going to happen to the patent in those non-UPC territories. Um, the grounds are very similar. There were a few additional grounds, national prior rights and entitlement that you can't raise at EPO proceedings, but you can raise at the UPC. Um, but I think what's going to be more interesting is that how you present your case is different. And I, my speculation is that where you need some fact based evidence, that may be more persuasive at the UPC, at the EPO. If you're trying to argue, for example, that something um, was known because of a commercial sale um, at, at the relevant time, that can be quite difficult in EPO opposition proceedings. Just procedurally, it's difficult. It's difficult to get the right evidence on file. And the standard of proof is, is very high, whereas it may be that um, that is more straightforward at the UPC where you can get witnesses in, um, you can have cross-examination, um, that, that kind of thing. So, and it will be interesting to see to what extent evidence presented at the UPC is then accepted in EPO opposition proceedings. It's, it's a whole new world, we, we just don't know. Um, and I think this is my final slide. Um, are they gonna stay proceedings? Well, the UPC has said it will consider staying proceedings when a rapid decision may be expected from the EPO. So I don't think this will come into play that often because it's rare that a rapid decision is expected from the EPO. But you could imagine if Board of Appeal uh, oral hearing was scheduled two weeks hence or you know a month hence or something like that, it may be that the UPC would stay its proceedings. Um, the UPC may request acceleration of EPO opposition proceedings and the EPO have just very recently said in their official journal what they will do in order to try and um, speed up proceedings, EPO proceedings where there's uh, parallel UPC proceedings. Um, but practically how much difference that's going to make, I, I don't know. The, the, to a certain extent, the timing of the 
uh, opposition is the timing of the opposition. It may be that oral hearings are scheduled a bit earlier if you're in this scenario, but it's it's not going to make a huge difference, I don't think. So that's it, really. I think I've passed back to Michelle now. Thank you, Maeve, and thank you, Victoria. That was an excellent and informative presentation. Um, before we begin the question and answer portion of our event, it would be greatly appreciated if everyone in the audience would please take a moment to complete our brief evaluation survey. As we strive to provide programs of value and continually improve our programs, we would appreciate your input, which will guide us in planning future programs. So it's now time to move to the questions um, from the audience. As a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, just click on the Q&A button and type your question into the Q&A window and then click Submit. And I've been watching some of the questions come in and I wanna thank both Maeve and Victoria for incorporating answers to some of those questions already into the presentation. Um, but I still do have a few questions here. Um, and uh, given how much you both know about these topics, I'll try to direct the question to one of you, but certainly we would like input from both of you on these questions. Um, so let me start with um, a question um, regarding um, ultimate complications with respect to occurrences in opposition. Um, the question is, even if not considered an admission of vulnerability, could auxiliary requests negatively impact claim construct claim interpretation by U.S. courts later on? Maeve? Yeah, start? that's a really interesting question. Um, and I suppose I'm going to give the lawyer answer, which will be, it depends. <laughs> but um, I, I think it would be possible to argue that auxiliary requests are a feature of European practice and you pretty much have to submit them and it would almost be negligent to not submit um, a series of narrowing requests and just because you submit a really narrow auxiliary request in European opposition proceedings I don't think that is an admission in any way that you don't think um, the broader requests are you know, allowable and patentable. So I think it would be hard for somebody in US proceedings to argue, well, you know, look at their auxiliary request 10. Um, it's really, really narrow. That means that they think that's the scope that they're entitled to. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think that that would happen unless you had technical statements that could be relied upon to show that really you only thought that auxiliary or request 10 was was decent. If if you had a series of auxiliary requests, they were all fully argued and you had good reasonable grounds for saying that the broader requests were were um, patentable, then I think it would be OK. Um, I, I think it's so important to have your auxiliary requests on file at the um, EPO because you might just end up with nothing otherwise that um, that's one occasion where what you need to do in Europe might trump US considerations. Um, but I'd be interested in Victoria's thoughts, um, whether she disagrees with me. No, I, I completely agree with you, Maeve. I think the mere filing of the auxiliary requests could not legitimately be used against you in any way. Um, you know, it's as May said, it's accepted practice to have fallback positions. Just because you filed an auxiliary request doesn't mean that you consider that is the only subject matter that is patentable. Um, of course, obviously, the requests that fall, <laughs> so the, the requests that you end up with on file and all of those auxiliary requests that are, are discounted before that, if that's the way your opposition goes, there may be something to read into that in US proceedings, but that would be the case with or without auxiliary requests, you know, what you end up with um, in Europe can be um, used to try and direct US proceedings. You know, you might say this is the, the claim they ended up with in Europe. Why is it much broader in the US or, or it should be simultaneously narrowed in the US? But that's an argument you're going to see potentially regardless. Um, so certainly do not 
approach your auxiliary requests with a view to um, affecting US prosecution in that way, you know, that's going to happen anyway. So do what you do, everything you can with your auxiliary requests. Thank you. Um, okay, Victoria, I'm going to stick with you for the next question. Do you have advice to increase the likelihood of success when filing late submissions prior to oral proceedings? Um, no. D does anyone else? <laughs> no, this is, um, I joke, but it's, it's one of the things that is quite unpredictable and difficult to um, advise on when you are considering making um, late submissions. Um, by default, you know, you've got to expect if you're filing them late, you're going to have an uphill battle to get them on file. The biggest thing that you can have as a trump card is that they are just unquestionably relevant. So the wording that we use in Europe is prima facie relevant. Um, so, you know, if you want to put something in that's late filed, it needs to go to the heart of the invention. It needs to be that the opposition division um, cannot go on and allow the patent without taking that evidence or that document into consideration. If you can argue that, um, then there's a good chance that you'll get that new evidence document argument on file. Um, but that's really the test. Is it prima facie relevant? After that, you're, yeah, you're into a uphill battle. I don't know if Maeve wants to add anything there. Yeah, the, the only thing I might add is it might help your case if you can provide some sort of justification as to why you're presenting something late. Like, you know, we only just got these results from the lab or this document only just came to our attention because it was cited in another case of ours by the Japanese Patent Office. If there's some sort of reason why you're late, that that may help, it may not do. But I think the more important thing is what Victoria just said, that it really has to go to the heart of the case um, and not be some sort of frivolous um, side issue. Um, but yeah, if, if, if you can provide some sort of justification, but it's really hard. And for people who've been working on oppositions for quite a long time, this has just got increasingly strict, or at least that's my kind of experience of it. It used to be, um, I don't know, easier to get things in late, whereas I, I kind of feel now um, it, it's it's much harder, which is good and bad. <laughs> um, it, yeah, but, but, but this is why one of the themes of our talk has been get everything on file early. It just makes your life so much easier because of this issue of difficulty getting things in late. I think one other possible point that can really help is if you've foreshadowed something so if your argument has been this claim is not supported across the scope this end of the claim isn't going to work and you've argued that and you've argued that and you've perhaps pointed to some prior art that helps you you've perhaps um done the experiments some experiments but they don't really quite show what it was that you really wanted them to show and then finally at the last hour you've got that data that really does show that top end of what's being claimed doesn't work you know, you're likely to get that on file. So if you're waiting for data and you really think it might come, foreshadow it in, in your submissions um, and that might help as well, or that will help as well. Great, very helpful. Okay, I have another question and Maeve, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Um, why would using a third party to carry out experiments be helpful, given that the fact that the party authorized those experiments and therefore their outcome, wouldn't that be discoverable? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I probably need to consult with my US colleagues to find out how third party experiments might be, might be helpful. But that was a suggestion from one of my US colleagues prior to this webinar when we were talking around these issues about, um, you know, you need data in Europe, maybe. You're not going to win the case in Europe, but there are these potential issues in the US. How might you get around that? And we, we talked about potentially using a third party and then having the third party only correspond with the European attorneys. Um, but if you could, 
Could you actually do that such that it was completely outside the scope of discovery? I'm not sure. But it, if getting that data was so important, that might be something worth um, worth going into with, with, with a US attorney who could advise on, is there a way of doing that such that it would be outside the scope of discovery if, if you did it in a certain way such that only particular people received the, received the data? Victoria, anything to add? Um, no, uh, not really. Uh, I think it's just this idea that there's kind of a level of separation. And, and as Maeve's just said, you can communicate uh, certain things to the European attorney and not go by the US Council. Um, but again, this is a great reason why <laughs> you have teams cross jurisdictionally cooperating, um, because, you know, we would be able to ask you, Michelle, <laughs> about discovery. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a team effort. It's a very good answer. It always is. Okay, I have one more question. Um, and maybe I'm going to flip back to you because I think you had spoken mostly about the UPC. Um, if a unitary patent is revoked by the UPC, how does this impact on non-unitary patent validated states, if at all? Yeah, that's that's a good question. From from a legal perspective, a strict legal perspective, there is no impact. The patent survives because the UPC revocation only extends to the territories of the UPC. So the patent still exists in those non-UPC states, so in the UK and Switzerland. But if it's been revoked for a clear lack of novelty, then then your patent in those other jurisdictions, well, it, it still exists, but is it valid any longer? And it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But I would say that a UPC revocation decision is going to be very um, persuasive in other jurisdictions. So, you know, it's possible that a UK court might say that a patent that's been revoked by the UPC is still valid, but that's that's going to be an uphill struggle. Um, unless the facts are different and unless different amendments are allowed in, it, it could play out differently. But I would generally expect that um, other national courts, so non, in non-UP states, would follow um, the decision of, of the UPC. The UPC they're going to be good. You know, they know what they're talking about. They've got great judges. They're, we're hoping that they're going to make sensible decisions. So you would expect other courts to follow those decisions, but they don't have to. And if the fact pattern were different, if the experts were different, if potentially um, different amendments were submitted, different claim amendments were submitted, you could, you could get a different result um, if the pattern were challenged in those other jurisdictions. But it but the patterns stand until they're challenged, until until there is a revocation action somewhere else. I don't know if Victoria has any additional thoughts on that. I mean I need to say that I think this is one of gonna be one of the most fascinating things going forward for at least the next probably seven years, just looking at how these uh, courts are going to sit side by side um, and how the decisions are going to come out the same or differently. Um, you know, the whole idea of the EPC is to is to essentially harmonise this and smooth this process out. Um, and so you're, you're going to, in that line of reasoning, want to see um, a similar decision from the EPO as from the EPC, um, but maybe we won't. <laughs> and what will happen when that starts to happen and you know how can one decision in one court be seen as more valid than another decision in another court and so if you've got contradictory decisions which one does the patentee believe you know uh, or the or the, the uh, potential infringer believe does that patent stand doesn't it stand um it's going to be very exciting Unless either of you have any final comments, I think we are ready to conclude the uh, presentation. So on that note, thank you everyone for attending today's webcast, Navigating Your Life Sciences Opposition, Tips for Best Practice When You Are Opposing or Opposed. This presentation will be available on demand in the next week. Please watch for an email from us with an access link and this concludes our webinar for today.
Thank you for participating in Finnegan's presentation.